Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Today, this the message is on from the new book, the beginning of our new book, Vaikha, which is also known as Leviticus. And it's it's going to contain all the instructions for the priesthood, the Levit Levitical priesthood and the different offerings. There are five various offerings. But what's important for us is to know how can we relate to this book today. So just from the first two verses, I already gleaned something that I want to share. Because remember, mm -hmm. Hebrew is a language of pictures, and it's trying to tell us a story. And it tells it through the, the words that these pictures provide for us. So in verse 3, and sorry, verse 2, we read, Adam mi yakriv mikem korban le Adonai le yud -he -vav -he. So Adam, the word Adam is a noun, and it refu refers to humanity, any human being. So here, it could mean any human who was willing could yakriv, which means draw near to God with a korban, an offering. And if you pay attention, yakriv, korban, they have the same uh, letters, the same root in Hebrew, which is kuf, resh, vet. And the word that we we derive from that is kerev. Kerev is, means to be able to approach, to draw near. So in verse 3, the next verse, we read two more words that have this same root. Korbano, his offering, and yakrivenu, which is also yakriv. And then the word yakriv is repeated. So five times we have this word kerev repeated in just the first two verses. So what is this picture telling us? And I was thinking, is it possible that what it's saying is that any Adam, any human being, which means male or female, native-born Israelite, or the Ger, the stranger who was with us, they were free to bring an offering to Mishkan if they wanted to approach the divine. What an awesome thought that we can be granted access to the divine presence of God. To me, it's incredible. It also tells us in verse 3 that the type of offering was an ola, translated as burnt offering. But as Rabbi told us, it's better understood as an elevation offering, ascend. You know, the word ola, it means it, it's an offering that allows people to be spiritually elevated as they approach God. Now, the same root for Ola is used when people make Aliyah to Israel. They call them Olim, which is plural of Ola. So you have this idea of ascension. They ascend, like we ascend to the Holy Land, to Israel. Now, to put it all in context, let's see who God and Moses were speaking to and when they were speaking. Well, just picture, these were newly freed slaves. They just finished working for one full year. This time they weren't working for Pharaoh. They were working for themselves to build a Mishkan that Moses gave them the instructions for. Now it was completed. It says the first day of the first month of the second year. So we know that it took them a whole year from the beginning of the instructions to build a Mishkan to the completion. And when was it finished? the month of Nisan, at Pesach. That's our new year. This would be a new beginning for this fledgling, this young new community. Now they had just been humbled, or better, shall I say, humiliated because of the great error, their sin that they committed when by the worshiping and the building of the golden calf, the Egel Zahab. They knew how guilty they were. They had just witnessed the Levites kill 3,000 of their family, their friends, their neighbors. And they probably heaved a sigh of relief that they were still alive. Now, this was just the beginning of their journey. And this Mishkan would now be the focal point where the people of Israel, again, native or the stranger among us, would begin to refocus their attention away from the gods of Egypt with all their pagan practices, toward the God of their fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
and his practices. They had forgotten him amidst the pomp and the glory of Egypt's wealthy temples and extravagant lifestyle. They had grown fat. They were safe, prosperous in the land of Goshen under Joseph's care until a new pharaoh, fearful of their growing number and status, decided to enslave them. When he sent out that command to kill all the Israelite male babies, anti-Semitism became the order of the day. Sound familiar? The gods of Egypt went to war with the God of Israel. And this has been repeated throughout the history of our people wherever we've been scattered right up until today. In America, North America, Vaikra shows us how to fight this war that is a spiritual war. Now, the next verse, verse 4, tells us that the person who was bringing a bull had to lay his hand on the bull's head. The word for lay in Hebrew is semicha, used when someone is ordained for their spiritual role. The offering would be accepted by God, who would then le caper, cover the person bringing it. Isn't it great to know that God has, has us covered, that we can feel safe? Now, verse 9 describes how the Adam, the person, bringing the offering, had to watch as its entrails and legs were washed with water, and the Kohen burnt it on the altar as an offering by fire of a pleasing aroma to the Lord. What about this type of sacrifice of this offering could be pleasing to God? In the next verse, we read that they could bring a pigeon or a turtle dove. The description of what was done to the bird sounds horrible. The Kohen shall tear it open by its wings without severing it. It had to twist off its head, turn it into smoke on the altar. And this was a pleasing aroma to God as it was burnt on the fire. You know, if I didn't know that our God is merciful and compassion, compassionate and that he loves his creation, I wouldn't want anything to do with this God. These pictures are so gruesome. Is our God a bloodthirsty God who requires the shedding of innocent blood to be appeased? Isn't that what the pagan gods demanded? So what is our Torah teaching us? How can we make any sense of this, especially to apply to our lives today? So stop for a minute. Imagine if you owned a flock of sheep, goats, cows, bulls, whatever, and you had to choose the best of them, a young bull, for example, without blemish, and watch it being cut to pieces and burnt up, how would it make you feel to know that this innocent, beautiful, young possession of yours had to die because of something you did? What a hard way to learn a lesson. But more than this, we're being shown that the pagan rituals of the day were so cruel, so merciless, and God said that they were an abomination to him. I believe that this is his way of showing us just how horrendous their types of offerings were, offerings that were supposed to appease their gods. And the Mishkan was where God would wean us away from those rituals. Informing the new nation, their paradigms, the paradigms of the people, would have to change. You and I might say, well, we're not involved in paganism. We don't support sacrificing virgins on the altar to ap appease the gods. But let's put that in today's terms. For example, what if I serve a god named Convenience? How many abortions are committed every year simply because it's not a convenient time to have a child? Now, there's an institute called the Guttmacher Institute, and according to them, roughly 121 million unintended pregnancies occur 
occurred each year between 2015 and 2019. Of these unintended pregnancies, 61% ended in abortion, not because there was something wrong with the baby or because the mother might die or because she was raped. Simply, this translates to 73 million abortions per year. That's a genocide of babies. Can we understand the repercussions of this from the Creator's perspective? Didn't He tell us in His commandments, do not commit premeditated murder? No matter how we may try to explain it away, it doesn't change the truth. This should cause us to want to draw near, to approach our God and beg Him for forgiveness. Tomorrow, we will celebrate the Feast of Purim. Our half Torah portion tells us that our prophet Samuel confronted King Saul, saying, The Lord sent you on a mission to go and utterly destroy the sinful Amalekites and fight them until you have exterminated them. Well, today's liberals would balk at such an, an order after all. Aren't we more humane than God? What they don't understand is the level of evil to which the Amalekites had descended. Neither did King Saul, <clears throat> who said to Samuel, But I did obey the voice of the Lord. I did go on the mission the Lord sent me. I captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and I've completely destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, they took the spoil, the sheep, the oxen, the best of the devoted things for me to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Look how Saul refused to acknowledge that he had disobeyed God's command. It just wasn't convenient. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obedience to the Lord's command? Even though Samuel did kill King Agag. The hatred in those who had been kept alive festered and grew against the Israelites until 500 years later, Agag's descendant, Haman, became the viceroy of Shushan. That was what we know today as Iran, where the Israelites were living after their first captivity into Babylon. Haman's hatred of the Jews was passed down through the generations and had been had built up to such an extent. Oh, no, no. Yeah, um, the, the hatred of the Jews were passed down from the time of Saul all the way through the generations to Haman to the, to the extent that he had devised a plan to destroy every last one of us. And he almost succeeded. If King Saul had obeyed God, there would have been no Haman, and perhaps today there would be no Hamas. Arafat claimed to be a descendant of the Amalekites, and his poison has spread throughout the Middle East where our people today are being held captive by these evil people. God wants to protect us from the consequences of our poor choices and to cover us, as he said in verse 3, le caper to cover us after we approach him to ask him to be forgiven for our transgressions. Bringing an offering to Mishkan, to the Mishkan, was as if we were admitting what we had done, that we had done something that displeased our Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, our Father in Heaven, although there were offerings that were simply thanksgiving offerings. But in this case, I'm talking about those where we didn't obey him. And how do we know what displeases our God? We judge them by the Ten Commandments that he gave us. They are the guidelines for our behavior. We are a chosen community, accountable to God first and then to each other. The Kohanim were the link between God and his people. The five types of offerings covered the areas in which we humans failed to be presentable to him. I know how I feel 
when I do something wrong. It starts to eat me up inside until I am forced to deal with it. And if I don't, I can become physically and emotionally ill. At that time, I would have taken an offering to the Kohen. Today, I need to work it out, both with myself and with my God, and together I'm with the people whom I hurt. If I don't, the consequences not only affect me, but everyone involved. And that can spread further than we can know. So why is it important for everyone to follow the precepts, the principles the writ, that the written Torah teaches us? The written Torah, the ten, the ten Commandments, the five books of Moses for what it says and not how others, including scholars, the PhDs, the rabbis, the priests, the whoever, how they interpret it for us. When people take the liberty of changing God's words, like King Saul did, to cover up his failure to comply, it may seem harmless, but it is not. Why would God tell us not to add or take away anything from what he handed Moses? When we do, it's as if we are saying that we are gods and that our words, our practices, and our rituals, our traditions are more important than what he gave us. This is exactly the same. This is what it means by taking his name in vain. Isn't that what we're seeing in the world today? Isn't that the cause of the increasing chaos? I started with the Hebrew words kerev, to approach, to draw near, and ola, to elevate. Whenever anyone wants to approach the Creator, He made the way for us to do that. No one can force us to bring an offering, to approach God. The offering represented our transgression. And when we bring it to God, we have to bring it to bring it to do it from our own volition, our own will. That's the way we fight our spiritual war. He forgives us. And this applies to both on, to both the personal level and the communal level. All the Moedim that God gave us were to have our people come together at the Mishkan at these appointed times bring our offerings, and at the communal level, ask him to heal us, to forgive us. And when we do, we take one more step to not only heal ourselves, heal our community, and ultimately heal the planet. That's what we call tikkun olam. Shabbat shalom.